Probably should start getting settled down, and uh, we'll be starting in just about a minute and a half, I think. If you'd like a, a bottle of water, there's some right here, and uh, I'd say raise your hand and I'll bring it to you, but I won't come get it. And you got one minute to get back to your seat. For those of you who are wondering, we're also online through our webpage, and we're making sure that connection is made, and it is. So, welcome to all of you that have come through the rainstorm, and particularly to those folks that are online. This is uh, going to be a very interesting and I think enjoyable evening regarding the Concord uh, gas holder. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. This is the first program in the new second Thursday of the month series presented by the Concord Historical Society. So if you look at your calendar, you'll see that next month is October 14th. You should come back here and be with us again, and I'll mention that again in a minute. But uh, first of all, uh, I'm Jim Milliken, and I'm the chair of the Concord Historical Society. And we're really, really delighted to be able to start these ongoing programs again. We uh, were involved earlier, several years ago, doing that, and here we are again.
Tonight's program is a joint effort of the Concord Historical Society and the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. And you may want to get to their webpage and see what's going on there. It's a program about the iconic Concord Gas Holder landmark, its history and recent efforts to preserve it. But first, future Second Thursday series programs will Uh, South Main Street down at the Concord Theater and uh, you got to show up there that's going to be a good program there's a small fee to get in uh, just a little bit more housekeeping at this time COVID precautions are being taken and masks are required and I'm seeing you all cooperating tremendously there are more here if you need them uh, I'll put mine back on in just a moment. And more importantly, there's uh, something else going on, and that is uh, our published history book, Cross Currents of Change, A History of Concord in the 20th Century, is available for sale tonight for only $20 per copy. Now that's more than half price right here. Uh, there's also a keepsake edition and that's $40. In addition to that, you're going to also see copies of Capital Views here. And Capital Views uh, is available uh, tonight for only $5 a copy. Now, you might be interested to know that that was written by Elizabeth Hagen, Hengen, oh goodness, I'm sorry, uh, and Gary Sampson. And, uh, since Liz is here, and there's a uh, there's an ink pen behind me, this would be a perfect time to get yourself a, a signed copies. Good deal for that. And we also have some of the 250th anniversary of the city coins here, and they're only ten dollars per copy. By those, they're all numbered. That's a big deal in the coin world and uh, you can pick a number there that you might like. Uh, also here on the table is the opportunity to get a membership application to join the Concord Historical Society and uh, board member Mark Cohen, who is over there, is also helping with that. And that draws to my attention, uh, Mark, the board, me board members present include Mark Cohen, uh, Jay Pike, who's back there enjoying the program. Uh, Jennifer Kredovic, you'll see Jennifer is hiding around the corner, but boy is she a big help. And uh, let's see, and of course myself, but what is really important for us is that we now have an executive director. And our executive, executive director is John Graffera and he's also filming. And if you don't know John, you're missing out on something. Um, make a point of saying hello to him before you go. Uh, the program is being live streamed through the Concord Historical Society website, and that's something you may want to write down because some people will get on and get the Concord Historical Society and California Concord comes right up very nicely. 
uh, and they won't help you a bit. What you need is ConcordHistoricalSociety.org. All of that, ConcordHistoricalSociety.org. Well, let's get started with the program. I appreciate your willingness to get all this stuff done up front. Uh, oh, by the way, recently the uh, campaign to save the Concord gas holder has also hit the national news, and uh, perhaps one of our speakers will tell you about that. I think Jennifer is well aware of that, but that's great for us. That gives us more exposure. Uh, the Concord Historical Society and the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance have joined hands to share with you the history of this iconic landmark and recent efforts to preserve it. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce, introduce to you two special Concord people, and they're our speakers tonight. Now, I'll start, I'm going to tell you about Liz Durfrey Hengen, has been an independent historic preservationist consultant to more than 40 years. She has worked on a range of preservation planning projects throughout the state, including a number here in Concord. She holds a degree in architectural history from Harvard, and she'll be sharing the brief history of the gas holder. And the other speaker is the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance Executive Director, Jennifer Goodman. Jennifer, like Liz, has worked on a very various number of projects throughout the state, and you can catch that on their webpage if you get a chance. Uh, the, her, her education is from Williams College and the University of Pennsylvania. Well, enough of that. Uh, we're going to let uh, Liz start us off, and there'll be a little break in between where we can maybe get some questions and answers, and then we'll pick right up uh, with Liz. I mean with Jennifer, excuse me. Liz, you've got the floor. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, participating in this Concord Historical Society event. It's just terrific to have programming put on over the course of the fall. And thank you on the board, and thank you, John, for getting this momentum going. We are, the whole city will benefit from it. So I'm going to tell you a bit about what this gas holder is and why we are interested in saving it. The Concord Gas Light Company was chartered in 1850, and the purpose of it was to manufacture um, gas from coal. The first use of manufactured gas was for street lights, and they were initially just found in a limited portion of downtown. But as the demand for gas increased for interior and exterior lighting, and as well as for heating and cooking, the company needed a larger storage unit to hold the manufactured gas. And thus, the gas holder house was erected in 1888. Similar buildings were built all across the country in lar the larger towns and cities as gas had become a really important fuel and it signified the prosperity of a community. The building consists of a brick shell that's 86 feet in diameter and 28 foot high walls. Inside the building, in fact, who here has ever had a chance to go inside it? A very few lucky people. It's, it's actually very plain and utilitarian inside, as these slides will show you. And these slides, I should add, were taken in 1982. But inside, there's a, a riveted tank that holds 80,000 pounds. Actually, let's go to the next one, then we'll come back to this. So this, okay, so here is the brick shell, and then this is a riveted metal tank that floats up and down. 
depending on how much gas is sitting in the tank. The water underneath here actually serves to help the tank float up and down depending on how much gas is in there. The gas came from other buildings that had been on the site, none of which remain, but that's where the actual manufacturing process happened, as this was just the holding unit. And then another pipe actually was the distribution pipe to send it out into the city. So we can you go back to the other one? Oh, we don't know how to go backwards. So if you were to go inside the building, this is what you would see. The middle slide is looking up at the roof framing, which is really quite intricate. And the other ones um, show the stairway that would take you up to the cupola. Um, and then if you see the vertical, um, these things, let's see if I can, uh, there we go. These serve as sort of guiding rods for that tank, because if the tank were full, um, it would be totally up in this building. What you're looking at is actually the top of that tank. It's down in the ground. And it looks solid, it is not. It is not something that's safe to walk on, which is one of the reasons why interior access has been so problematic all these years. Okay. Yeah. The round shape of the gas holder buildings made them instantly recognizable, and they were truly symbols of a progressive community. The buildings were designed to be eye-catching, and indeed, Concord's gas holder house is very visible as you're driving along the interstate and as you come into town from the south. It captures your attention. Next slide. But even though it was a utilitarian structure, it was really beautifully crafted. And you can see that there are um, In theory, this works. There we go. Okay, thanks. So there are these 12 pilasters that go all around the outside, granite trim. These narrow windows all have a lovely arch to them. The glass is also arched, hood mold. This is a marble date plate, brick corbeling. And then the crowning piece is the cupola, which actually also had a utilitarian function. It was designed to let any um, leaking gas ventilate out. The gas holder was an integral part of a lengthy industrial corridor that stretched um, about two and a half miles and was really the economic backbone of the city of Concord for over 125 years. The northern part of the corridor is up at Horseshoe Pond, which you see at the top of the slide. And just to orient yourself, the, the uh, railroad station is on the right toward the lower right corner. And the southern end of the industrial corridor, which is not shown in this slide, would have been down at the repair shops for the railroad. Most of the city's industries were strung along this transportation corridor that was served initially by the river, and then by the railroad, and then more recently by the interstate. It was a busy and very noisy, at times very smelly, um, corridor, and it employed thousands of workers. Virtually all of the industries that were strung along this corridor were dependent on manufactured coal gas for heat and for um, light. And I think it's interesting to see what some of these industries were that relied upon the coal gas. Um, at the northern end was Page Belting. In fact, Mark Cohen is here. Um, are you, you're still president of Page Belting Company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As of this minute, he is. But Page Belting has been in Concord for, well, 150 plus years now. And it produced leather belting that was crucial to factories across the entire country to operate the machinery. Just south of uh, Page Belting was the Rumford Press, which was the largest printing plant in the eastern part of the United States. 
and it's where many of the very widely circulated magazines were printed. So here in Concord, Atlantic Monthly was printed, Reader's Digest was printed, House Beautiful. And you might be interested to know that because all of these magazines are actually shipped out of the Concord Post Office, over the course of a year, there were more second class postage receipts just here in Concord than the states of Connecticut, Vermont, and Rhode Island combined. Huge industry. Next. A number of iron foundries were also within the corridor. The Ford foundry shown at the bottom made stoves and sinks and plows, while the Clapp foundry made castings for the railroad and building materials, manhole covers, and it also made a nationally popular drinking fountain that was designed to serve people and horses and dogs and had a patented system of pipes that kept the water moving so it never froze. Farther south along the industrial corridor was this um, building on South Main Street where the Love Building now stands. And it's hold a variety of industries over the years. Initially, pianos and organs were made here. More recently, a book bindery. In fact, if you go into the Love Building, you can see some of the early machinery that was used or produced in this building. And at the south end of the corridor was the Abbott Downing Complex, which was a world-renowned maker of stagecoaches, probably our most famous industry. And it occupied an entire block just above the gas holder from which it received its fuel. Immediately next door to the gas holder, and this building is still here, was the Holt Brothers. It made wagon spokes and hubs for Abbott Downing. Holt soon expanded into farm implements, and in fact, one of the four brothers held the patent for the harvester and the caterpillar tractor. So it's no surprise that the gas holder house was purposefully sited very close to the railroad tracks because all of the coal that fueled the manufacturing of gas came by rail. And yes, the railroad station and the repair shops south of the gas holder also relied on manufactured gas. In 1921, a new and much larger steel gas holder was built adjacent to the 1888 brick building. Three years, decades later, in the early 1950s, the gas company switched from manufactured gas to natural gas, which could then be piped directly to the end user. And thus, both of these gas holder houses were taken out of service. The steel gas holder house came down in the late 80s, but the 1888 brick building, despite being empty and unused since 1953, was carefully preserved by the gas company for many years. Gas holders once dotted the urban landscape, and in fact, Concord had three gas holders. But today, there are believed to be only 14 of these gas holder houses left across the entire country. And we believe that Concord's build house is the only one to still have the inner workings. Nearly 40 years ago, in recognition of its rarity, the building was recorded by the Historic American Engineering Record. And this is a photo of the crew at work. Most of the black and white photographs you've seen were all from that 1982 recording. The project was, it was a federal program and overseen by the Smithsonian Curator. Since then, the building's been listed on the National Register of Historic Places at the national level, which is the highest accord for National Register listing and a somewhat rare instance. So originally owned by the Concord Gas Company, Energy North acquired the building in 1985 and it, in turn, sold it to Liberty Utilities in 2012. The very next year, a tree fell on the slate roof during a storm, 
and it damaged the wooden thrust ring that was at the base of the roof and also damaged some of the supporting brick masonry below. A year after that, and after the building had been declared one of the seven most endangered historic properties in the state, Liberty Utilities put a temporary patch on the roof, but it really wasn't enough and deterioration continued. So 60 years ago, 61 to be absolute accurate, the, we lost our railroad station. And there were few who really mourned its loss at that time as public and local leaders welcomed the city's first shopping center with its enormous parking lot all viewed as a sign of progress. Now, I've lived in Concord for 40 years and I haven't yet met someone who doesn't just sigh in deep regret at the idea of the railroad station having been torn down. So we don't want to repeat history. We have a nationally significant building and while far smaller, it really is a stately icon of Concord's history and industrial growth. And also it tells the story of how fuel was, has been used over the years. In the last 12 months, there's been a grassroots effort led by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance with support from the Concord City Council and in more recent months also from Liberty Utilities and it slowly brought us to where we are today. And I will let Jennifer talk about the today part and the future part. This is an opportunity to ask a couple of questions, if you'd like, while Jennifer gets her piece together. Yes, sir. Because of the significance that 
uh, Liz laid out so, so wonderfully, and because of the building's vulnerability and because of the opportunities. Um, in terms of the vulnerability, we've been working with a structural engineer um, from a, a business called Structures North, and he likes to use a, the face of a clock as a way to talk about vulnerability and challenge. Um, and the first time he went to the building, he said, 11 p.m. You're already at 11 p.m. for this building. And I think when he got in a little farther, right, Frank, he's, he's saying 11.45 or 11.59. So there was really a need to move and make sure we didn't have a loss of this last of its kind landmark. Um, so over the last uh, 12 to 14 months, uh, the Preservation Alliance, working closely with Liberty, City of, Ut so City of Concord, uh, and other players has been trying to move things forward. Doing some research, looking at redevelopment options, um, understanding where the stakeholders stood on this building, collecting information, and then trying to negotiate some next steps. Um, Liz, if you could go to the next. The big words on the screen next is, we were, I felt like we had a lot of questions coming at us in terms of how the building could be used, how the property could be used. So as part of that process over the last uh, 12, 14 months, we set, had a series of guiding principles in place. And I'm not going to read this all or expect you to, but it was about the preservation of this iconic building. That's sort of the first set. And, and, and hoping and in trying to ensure that there could be public access to the property, there could be enjoyment of this and understanding of this great property. Um, but also that whole second point there in bold that um, it was doing more than preserving the building. It really could be part of um, the building's redevelopment could be a catalyst for that whole gateway into the capital city, that whole corridor uh, that I know used to have a moniker of crud corridor. Really, it's the opportunity corridor and wanting to see this building's redevelopment be part of that. I also note there in bold about um, addressing the environmental contaminants on site. Um, not surprising, right, this industrial, heavily used industrial site has contaminants um, being managed by Liberty Utilities. Uh, the building actually currently right now serves as a cap on some of the contaminants potentially in the site and the preservation uh, guideline was around um, continuing to have that sort of extra benefit of the preservation project serving as a cap from an environmental standpoint. Um, next, please. Um, Lots of negotiations sort of about what could be next. And this uh, building, this picture symbolizes uh, the three major parties that have been working on this. The Preservation Alliance, Liberty Utilities, and the city signing a memorandum of agreement um, back in April that prevented the demolition, um, committed to a, a sharing of costs for the immediate stabilization of the building between the owner, Liberty Utilities, and the Preservation Alliance, which we were able to do through some incredibly generous donations to the, to the organization, um, and kind of laying out a path for what could be next, um, how we would sort of share roles and responsibilities relative to this project going forward. Um, can we go to the next please? Um, so we're excited that we've moved so far along and that um, this critical stabilization work feels very imminent. Uh, we're really hoping to get the work done uh, this fall and into the winter um, to address that um, broken ring that Liz talked about a little bit and um, avoid a catastrophic loss, set up uh, positive redevelopment for the future. Um, so um, if there's questions about the work, I know I've got, um, there's many people in this room who have, who have played a great role in getting us to where we are today. And, just wanted to mention that um, Frank LeMay from Milestone Construction and Michael Bruss from Bruss Project Management are part of that team, and maybe we have some questions for them later about the actual work. Um, just wanted to do one more slide about the work. Um, it, it is a um, complicated kind of work, right, with this um, uh, building that's structurally compromised and a a void in the floor with this uh, upside down cup, not a real floor. So we're really pleased that in addition to um, the two gentlemen and the, the companies that I just mentioned, um, we've got a great team of specialists that are gonna help us do that initial stabilization work. Um, I mentioned the structural um, engineer before Structures North, 
and they've done the design that will be implemented by a group called Yankee Steeplejack. And I just offered a couple of photos of the work that they've done over time. That this really cool steeple right here. Those are mills in Dover, New Hampshire, and um, a great building, uh, Salva Regina's building in Newport that I put in. So I also do remember to share another concept or idea with you. Um, I just, I really love how um, there's been connections to this project, both from you know people obviously in Concord and in the neighborhood that have great stories to share regarding the building when it was working and then when it was just a neighborhood icon, but also people around the country who have reached out to us just curious or with ideas or support in different ways. And the Newport connection um, is that our structural engineer, John Watney from Structures North, tells stories that um, we were trying to convince him to be our guy, and he's really, really busy, as a lot of tradespeople are right now. And he was on the top of a Newport mansion doing an assessment for his day job, and somehow the gas holder came up and his client up there on the roof of the mansion said, well, you have to do it. It's the last of its kind in the building, in the whole country. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, maybe I should. And then in another job, he's taking Amtrak, you know, in the, in the Northeast Corridor, and he's got his laptop open and he's working on the gas holder for us. And, um, you know, somebody across the aisle said, hey, I know that building. You know, I used to visit my grandmother in that neighborhood and it was always a beacon. We knew we were coming home and, um, you know, she, she obviously was around when it was working and just all these great connections. You know, those are just a couple of stories from our structural engineer, but you all know that there are so many, so many more of those. Um, so we go to the next. Just have a couple more points to make. Um, we're, we're doing this, this work coming up that I was just describing to avoid the big loss. We don't want to see this thing go. And again, as I said before, um, to hopefully be a real insider, a real catalyst for activity in that corridor. And you're going to see a couple of slides that were part of the planning that we did through last winter that the um, City of Concord supported along with the Preservation Alliance. And, uh, the lead consultant is here, actually, Stu Arnett from ADG, the ADG Group Report. Um, so I think this point is a lovely one about you know, why the gas holder has a leg up to be that kind of catalyst more than maybe another kind of old building around town. And you can use this phrase, location efficient district, when you're at the, your next cocktail party or you want to impress somebody. I think it's a cool planning phrase. I live in a location efficient district. <laughs> But the point here, obviously, is that the gas holder with a little yellow circle um, is so close to all these other assets, right? You're close to downtown, you're close to the neighborhood, you're close to the river, the rail trail is expanding. Isn't it cool how something going on there could be connected to so many other important assets of the city? Um, the next, I think, is a concept just about how we want to preserve the gas holder, but there's a potential for more on the site. So this is a, a, just a concept that um, Stuart had in the report talking about other lively activities on the site, that there's room for another building on the site, maybe um, 5,000 to 10,000 square feet. Um, they're named as a commercial building, but certainly could be some sort of um, compatible institutional or commercial venture that fits well with the whole rest of the site. Um, the next one, please. And this is my last slide just to um, kind of drive home that idea that those guiding principles were about bringing uh, liveliness, activity, having it be a viable place. Um, it, in programs like this, over time, we've heard people talk about lighting, uh, the fact that you can see it from the highway. It's such an icon of Concord. Wouldn't it be cool to have some uh, interactive lighting, some uh, lighting that highlights it and its future use. Um, this Philadelphia slide down in the lower left of the Franklin Court is just to remind us of the possibilities of telling the whole story there. We have the gas holder still there. How could we interpret it in a really effective way? But then there's the whole rest of the site, the other buildings that are now gone. How do you tell the story of the kind of muscle that was happening there on that site? Um, and there's many models around the country of um, Industrial places having recreational and cultural activity. Um, Seattle's on the left and 
hard to see it, but that's an image of um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, with um, events with the um, steel plants as the back backdrop. So lots of possibilities. We need to do this early work to kind of leave open the opportunity to get there. Um, just going to finish up with another, another slide. Yeah. Um, I, um, I guess I just wanted to um, offer some closing remarks and not forget to say um, we've got yard signs, if you want a yard sign to take home or give to a friend or neighbor, and little handouts. There's lots of information on saveourgasholder.org. Um, can make a donation to the outreach effort. You can sign a petition saying you support it. Sign up for email, and we're going to be continue to post news on that site. Um, I want to thank the people in this room that have gone above and beyond already, and I know we'll do a lot more. And I'm not going to name all of you because I'm going to forget you. But there's city councilors here who've been wonderful environmental experts like John Regan in the back somewhere. Um, really appreciate the Concord Historical Society and John and others stepping up to assist with this. Althea, John, I could go on and on. Um, the Preservation Alliance um, works on about 100 community projects every year. Nonprofit, providing services, resources, small grants, networking. And we're really digging into this one because of the things I talked about at the top of my presentation. It's so significant. It's national significance, last of its kind. The vulnerability, the 11.59 p.m.-ish part of this, and the opportunity that i just showing some conceptual images of there at the end. Um, uh, 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 there's, um, we're making good progress. It's exciting to be at the cusp of um, actually doing some of the stabilization work. Uh, there's still a lot more to do. There's a lot more money to raise. There's figuring out its final use. Um, but we feel very buoyed by the fact that um, in sort of informal and more formal ways, people are reaching out all the time and um, helping out, um, making financial contributions, um, sharing great ideas. And that gives us momentum and makes it all seem really possible. Um, and it was this icon of progress and prosperity, as Liz said. and Hopefully it can again be this great symbol and beacon for us of um, good news and good times and good activity in the future. So thanks to everybody for helping out. <laughs> I think that little- Don't go away. I won't go away. And I, yeah. we want people's comments and questions. You want to take it one more? Can you take it one more, Liz, just for the website? Oh, go ahead. You all set? I'm all set. Thank you. See a question in the back, good and loud. I'm one of the people who's actually been inside this building on a public tour several decades ago, wow. you might imagine. And at that time, they said, no way anyone's going to walk upstairs to the people. Walk. In fact, they even were allowed to get inside the building, might even go out of the fence. But the interesting thing he said at that time was that there was no longer any gas line up there. But as far as he was concerned, if you got some fresh air, saying wouldn't it be great if you could make it work again or at least leave the insides intact or interpret it so that people understood better what it actually used to do. Um, and I would just do a shout out for John's film Films Up of Cedric Dustin that um, who, who knows the building better than anybody probably right now who talks about things like that like what it sounded like when it was going up and down and um, more about the mechanics of the actual operation. I don't know if that answered it. Do you have anything else to? Liz, come this way. <laughs> Any uh, other questions? Uh, when was that, that you were in it? Yeah. <laughs> OK. I, I have recently located a person who actually has climbed those stairs to the very top. And uh, I haven't introduced him to the group yet, but he's anxious to talk to us. And uh, he, when Dusty became president of the company, he took 
his job as chief engineer. So oh. we've got another story that's, a great that's story. coming. It's yeah. going to be a great story. Great. Yeah. 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 Huh. Uh, I saw a hand. That's a big question, and I know that they're wrestling with that, but it's a contaminated spot. And how do you deal with that? Right. I think we're trying to leave the door open to that, to answer that question about whether the building could be used or not. I think, you know, the work we did earlier in the year that I referenced that uh, ADG was involved with really was saying, is there a way to do something else on the site that makes the whole property more viable and maybe makes it easier not to do anything in the building, to leave it intact and not to have the expense of trying to do something creative that's a win-win. Uh, so I think it's still an open question, but I think preserving the interior is preferred, as I said earlier in my presentation. Well, and phase one is stabilization. So phase hey, two. Liz, come a little closer. Phase two is exploring all of those more complicated questions about use of the site and use of the building. Good questions. Yeah, Very good questions. That's a classic question. Question is, there's a possibility of having a drone inside the building. And I can tell you that the Concord Historical Society has taken a look at that, and John is has looked at it, and there's real difficulty getting inside the building. It is a safety hazard to be in the building. Uh, the real value is, I think, in the fact that when you come to town, it's there. It's a, it's a monument, it's a, it's a place that we all know when we uh, enter from the southern part of our, of our city. Yeah, that's a great question. I know there's one on the, oh, it was, uh, the point was to, we could at least do exterior drone work if we can't, if it's too hard to do interior drone work. I think we could do more. There, there's a really short, like 45 second drone video on the, connected to the Concord Chamber site that I know we have connected on the Save Our Gas Holder site as well. Um, the engineer did a lot of drone footage when he was there doing as part of his investigation. We have photos from it. I know that he thinks it's a risk like you just said, that you might be uh, investing in a drone and work that <laughs> you lose, right? You don't end up getting the footage or, and you lose the drone. But, so it has been used, I think we could do more, yep. And just helping people envision what it could be too, I think is gonna be really important in the next phases, so. But drone stuff is great. You know, um, how far to the south of the building does Liberty own and then after that, what entity owns below that? Yeah. Uh, the question was about ownership, and I forgot ever to say the acreage, which is just over two acres that they own on that site. Um, I'm not going to remember the name of the adjacent owners, to tell you the truth. The Sunel. Oh, Sunel right to the south, right, right. And there's... What about the northern, where it comes up to the corner? It's the fenced-in area. Well, and that's, there's the business owners to the north. Yep, yep. Stu, I don't know if you remember who's behind it. Um, there's a variety of owners, and that's the area that's now in front of the planning board for the mixed-use uh, apartment co commercial complex. It's sort of as shown on the plan for a mixed-use development. Yeah, yeah. There's like four owners, including the bus company, um, that's, that's privately owned. Yeah. Liberty stopped with the fence. Yeah. So I don't know if everybody heard that about the mix of owners, and you were also just introducing that other point that I was trying to, you know, share the concept of gas holder as catalyst and but. There's other great things starting to happen in that corridor. There's obviously great businesses and residences already, but the housing proposal that 
Stu Arnett just mentioned, um, new tenants for Taylor Rental right there to the south, uh, Brew Pub and Smokestack Shack. <laughs> so, so good. It's have any of these people been approached yet to be part of the planning process? Uh, maybe the other as, owners? Such as sales. Yeah. Sales. Um, there's always more we can do, I think, okay. in later phases, but um, we certainly have talked to some of the property owners right there, trying to pay attention to uh, who wants to have a voice in the process mm -hmm. and who can help, basically, in the, for the big hurdles we have ahead of us. I suspect they're paying very close attention even to tonight's presentation. as Jennifer said, whatever happens on the gas holder just has so much potential to have a catalytic effect for a vast area, particularly to the south. Yeah. 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 And I, I do want to give a little shout out to the Concord Heritage Commission that were the ones that got the National Register nomination done, which was a really important early step in all of this. And um, our the city councilors who are here and other um, city staff have been really um, a good partner in all of this as well. Any other questions? Well, then it'd be my job to thank you all for coming, point out that there are some signs here that they have talking about save the uh, uh, gas holder. There is also some books, and uh, you have the opportunity to have one of the authors actually <laughs> sign a book for you tonight. So. Uh, that being said, thank you all very much for coming. We'll see you on the 14th.